All right, uh, let's make a formal introduction for our, our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, Jerry. My name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., uh, from the city of Fairfax City. We're very grateful that Jerry Maroda accepted our invitation to our show. Jerry, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Good to, good to be here with you. Uh, same as well. Thank you very much. Jerry, uh, let's go back to the beginning. Were you born like in a musical family? I mean, how old were you when you perhaps began taking, I don't know, guitar lesson or piano lesson, like all the all the little kids? No, not not really a musical. My father was a dancer, um, and he played a little bit of guitar, but but not seriously. Um, but uh, yeah, no, just uh, just really somehow. I mean, I I liked music, and I started taking clarinet lessons when I was in the fourth grade, um, and my teacher said that I. I don't, I can't play the clarinet. I'm bad. I'm bad. Very, very bad. Stop, <laughs> stop playing the clarinet. Jerry must stop playing the clarinet. So, and then uh, at around the same time, my brother somehow, who's older than me by about eight years, he, yep. he, he, a friend of his um, went to Vietnam. This was in the mid sixties, 1965, something like that. 66. He, he, um, he went to Vietnam, and and my brother, he gave my brother his drums to hold on to while he was away. So, my brother started banging on the drums. He, my brother was in college, I was ten, so we both started bashing away at the drums and uh, just enjoyed enjoyed it. Really, that's that's really how it all hap how it all happened. You have any formal lesson when you were? I don't know. You you liked. Rams at 10. What what happened when you were 12, 15? You asked your parent, hey, I'm I wanna, you know, take it to the next level. Can you I wasn't thinking I wasn't I wasn't thinking like that, but I I um no formal lessons. Yeah. Just like my brother, my older brother both uh, just taught myself how to play the drums. Yeah. And so as did my brother. Um and I would listen to him. He was older and um yeah, no formal lessons. I didn't really think much about whether I wanted to become a, a you know a professional drummer or not, but it just happened. I mean, it wow. it, it it and I got I my brother got very good very fast, and he started to become rather successful in New York doing sessions. And within a few years, he was he was really? working doing well. Yeah, he was working very you know he he was playing on a lot of records and stuff and. And so, but I was younger, but I kept working at it. And yeah, by the time I was about 17, I, I was the first time I went out on the road with the band that had a record. Actually, my brother had played, he had record, he had done the drums on their record. They were on which, Columbia. Which band was it? That's Orleans or no? That the, no, no. This is a band. They were called Arthur Hurley and Gottlieb. Three guys. Yeah. Very much. This is 1973. Very yep. much like um, like uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash. You know, back then that was a very popular sound. So yeah, I started. I went and I played with them. They wanted my brother to tour with them, but he was too busy in New York. So I I went and played with them. He recommended me. I went and played with them, and they we all got along well. And I became their drummer, and that's what I, that's how things all got started. And. Right. Uh, yeah, about a year, maybe a year, year and a half later after that, I had an opportunity to play, uh, auditioned and play with a band called Orleans. Yeah. Which at the time, they were probably my favorite band on the planet. I, I knew them. I wow. knew them and, I, and I loved them. So it was like a dream come true to get the job. I got I got chosen. So I joined Orleans. And so that was an amazing uh, experience. And in that that raised me my level up because orleans was very they had already had a hit record and then we went and made a record in in la and and i played on the you know various stuff there was another drummer in the band as well there's two of us so i played on my first real hit record called still the one which is you can still hear it on the radio and that was like 1975 76 something like that yeah um and then that that um, I did that for about two years, and 
and then the lead the leader of that band quit the band and and so i was i was devastated you know i i i because i was i was i was so happy to be in that band so i went out to california you know my brother was living out there and i was living in new york in manhattan so i went to california just to hang out um i can't remember exactly why but while i was out there somehow somebody um handed me a tape cassette tape of a singer an english singer named peter gabriel i i didn't know who he was but then they said yeah he's he's looking for a drummer and um i don't remember clearly exactly how it happened but all i know is that i listened to that first peter gabriel record if you're a fan of peters and you know the, the big, big time yeah big time big time very 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 strange music very me, different yeah because yeah. my upbringing was motown i True. was bl black i grew up like i learned to play the drums listening to black records only black, like motown stacks philly you know all, all black records. so that's that's my that was my that was my favorite thing um, the Peter Gabriel, when I listened to that first record, it was like, there's no black, there's no Motown on that record. It's, it's very, very different, you know, very, very British, very, so I don't know, just, it's just not, not, it was nothing like what I'd been used to, but, but I was a very smart and very um, open-minded. And I also didn't have a job because my band broke up. So that, that, Thing, the, the offer was um, they offered me the job with, without ever meeting Peter or doing... Really? We, you didn't have to audition because Peter went to New York and, well, it, well, it, it was in London, but you were in you were in California with your brother, right? So No, no, you know, no but I was living in New York and, uh, and yeah. what, what happened was um, Peter did a promotional tour. Back then record companies did promo tours and they paid for them and the, the band was the band that did the record. The guys that played on his record, um, I think Steve Hunter, you know, um, Tony Levin, Larry Fast, um, and um, and then when the promotional tour was done, the guys that were playing, a lot of the guys that were in the band were New York session guys. They weren't going to go on tour with Peter Gabriel, but Tony and Larry did want to continue with Peter, and Correct. and so I joined them. I joined that. Um, and I flew out, it was, I don't know, August, September, I flew to England and started rehearsing with Peter and, and became like really the, 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 that was the band touring band. And then we, we, you know, I figured maybe it would be, I would do this tour and then it would be done. It would be done. Um, because I didn't know whether he would like me or like, like my music, my playing, but in the end, of course, it, we, we worked together for about 10 years. So, and I did, I recorded the next record with him, with Robert Fripp, Robert Fripp That's produced it. And then the great. next record with the melting face, you know, the Fripp record is the scratching record. That's correct, yeah. The one with, um, that Steve Lillywhite produced the one with the melting face. I think it might've had games without frontiers on it, stuff like that. Um, and yeah, then, yeah. and then the next one was um, the security record. Yeah, did that, and then um, up until that, and we were touring and recording and touring and recording, and and uh, uh, so I that I was with Peter for throughout most of that time, um, and and I enjoyed it every minute of it, and um, but in the process, in that first couple of years, then I started to get known, and people were approaching me. To play with them like Hall and Oates. I started doing sessions. I worked with yeah, Hall and yeah, Oates. Yeah. I mean, I, Daryl Hall came to a, a Gabriel show in New York. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And and then his manager called me the next day and he said, "Yeah, that Daryl's like flipping out. He want he he really want, wants to know they they need to make another record and, and he he wants you to be he wants you to be part of it." So I started working with Hall and Oates and Peter, you know, back and forth. That went on for a couple of years. And then I was doing other sessions with other artists. So I, my career started to open up. I started playing with a lot of different people, more, more and more. Let me, let me ask you a couple of questions there. Let me unpack everything you, you said. And um, 
Although, so you were a guy who like, you know, Motown and you were playing with Peter Gabriel, different type of music in the back of your head, say, man, I, I like, I'm getting paid well with Peter Gabriel. I'm traveling around the world, but I want to go back to what I really like. And that probably was uh, an enticement for you to, you know, start working with uh, Holland O's for that particular reason. Because what what the type of music that I don't know you like? I'm not a drummer, so I don't know. Uh, no, it's a good you know, good you, question. Good question. You know. I loved playing with Hall and Oates. Loved yeah. it, and I loved playing with Peter. But it was very different, and it was yeah. it was. I learned a lot from Peter, and uh, and then my yeah. my whole approach to music changed. But playing with Hall and Oates, it was. Rock and soul, Philly. They're from Philadelphia. Philadelphia, you know, yeah, of course. They're, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, it was rock and soul. I was in heaven, heaven, and they really wanted me to stay with them. But mm. I, I, and I, pretty, I, I really enjoyed the playing the music, maybe a little more than with Peter. Although I, I loved playing with Peter, but, but I just remained loyal to Peter. I, I, I just felt that, I felt a, a, a sense of loyalty. I, I didn't. And Tony, Larry, you know, and we had a couple of different guitar players, and eventually we ended up with David Rhodes, who David Rhodes, he was, yeah, he yeah. was. And then I had gotten, I had gotten my friend, my best friend, who I grew up with. We went to, you know, high school together. Tim Capello, he, I, I got him to tour and record a record, one of the records that we did with Peter. Um, and he came out and toured with play saxophone and piano and he eventually went on to play with tina turner for for like i don't know 20 years or more you know, you know when she broke big time tim tim ended up in in uh playing with tina tina for years um so but the core band of david tony larry and i and peter you know yeah. we, we 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 had a real tremendous um uh communication yeah Okay. And and we developed a, a real deep uh, relationship. You know, uh, Hall and Oates was just more. It was more fun for me in a way because it was it was the music more the music that I really loved to play. That the, the yep. you know the the soul you know black 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 um, based and black music. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, no. Uh, tell me, how, when with working with Peter Gabriel and uh, in, in general, right? Um, how was the session? If Peter was the kind of guy that came with everything prepared, and then I want you to play drum in this track. I want you, David Rod. I want you to do or Tony Levin. I know all this guy, or or he came no. with an idea, high level idea, and then no. let's try to make it happen. No, he he came up with. He came in. He never had anything finished. Never had any real, lot of times no lyric, maybe an idea, maybe for a, for a title, um, but wow. no, every, every no, he had no, he hadn't com written completed anything, but he wanted to do that. He wanted to get into the studio and 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 then you know mold the music w with Tony and Larry and me and David Rhodes. And that 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 was very good. That went very well. But no, he never came in and told anybody what to do or play. He had ideas, like you know, but he wanted things to be unusual, you know, especially the drums, um, drumming, especially like, and and I adapted my style. I, I did a very good job, I think, of doing that. Um, playing yeah, more, know, absolutely more tribal drum, you know, like not playing straight, not playing drums straight drums. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I approached the drums. It was more sort of not orchestral, but it was more. It wasn't. It wasn't traditional. You know, most of it. Some of it was, but I think he was always striving to do something different. Uh, which, he was open to for all of you, Tony. They wrote to all of all you guys contribute, and then the first draft of a track. Let's revisit that in a couple of days. Let's go to the second track. So you were an integral part of that. You were not just a drama. You were all of you were were part of the band, if you will. You know, so very, very much so. Yeah, yeah. because uh, nowadays, well, 
Peter just finished the, the tour. I went to see him in London and I saw him in a different time with he's still with Tony Levin and David Rose and you know he's playing with Manu Gachi, the, the French guy and so on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um let me let me ask you with you, how was to do what was it like to to work with Peter and, and Robert Fripp in the same room when he ended up producing the record? What what recollection do you have for that? Well because for, Robert Fripp is a it's a di- Completely different character, you know. It's a... <laughs> I I knew nothing about Robert Fripp, and I you knew don't nothing know who about who he was or nothing. I, or... I knew nothing about King Crimson. I was not a frog. I, I wasn't into that and stuff. Yeah, I was into soul music, soul music, American. Yeah. But so I heard a lot of stories about Robert Fripp, and that he's very strange, and he doesn't talk a lot, and he's just you know blah blah blah. You be very so. What's interesting. It's funny, you asked a good question. Very good question. So the very first session that I did with Robert was in Holland. We went to Holland at a studio in Holland that Genesis had recorded at. We went there and uh, as a residential studio to to um, re- record. And so we're in the studio. We get set up, setting up my drums. Sure. I don't know Robert Fripp. I don't know anything about the guy. And so, and I'm, but I'm a little bit curious and a little bit not sure if our, I, I, I'm Italian, you know, background, my family, we're very, you know, you know, we're, we're like you, we're like, yeah. you know, we're Latin, you know, but I, and he's very English. And I heard very, like a lot of things about him being very like straight and blah, blah, blah. Exactly. Very different for you and I. <laughs> so I was, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So we, we set up and we did like the first day, first day. We were, I don't know, we played, played, did a little bit of playing. And Robert came to me and he said, would you stay after the session? Would you please stay after the session? So I'm thinking he's going to send me home. Like, because don't come back. You're yeah, ex- ex- exactly. I think, uh, you know, uh, because I'm, you know, I'm not the right guy and he's going to send me home. So I stayed after the session. Everybody left. He invites me into the control room. He he said, um, sit, have a seat. S- sit down on the couch in the control room. And he had the two. Revox tape machines, Frippertronics, you know the thing he called Frippertronics? Yeah, he used With, to use that to track, yeah, to do. Yeah. Two, two, two machines, one feeding the other one. One machine yep. feeding the other one. And I'm sitting there, and he starts playing, and he, and he creates one of his soundscapes, one of those you know, Frippertronic soundscapes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I know what you and, mean. Yeah. And, and then... Um, we, he said, oh, th- thanks. You know, thank you, Jerry. Yeah. And, uh, I'll see you tomorrow. And so honestly, Claudio, I thought when I walked away and I'm scratching my head and back then I had a lot more hair than I do now, I'm scratching my head and I'm thinking, wow. I mean, I just don't know what to expect, but sure. when, in hindsight, Robert and I developed a very close relationship musically for for a period of time. And I think what he did was it was his way of embracing me. Embracing you, right. Like he allowed me to sit and listen to him create this thing. I don't think he would at the time. I don't think he did that with a lot of people. You know what I mean? I think I it was exactly it was yeah. it was a special thing that he shared it with me. He shared it with me. That's the only thing I could say. I mean, I don't know what he would say, but um, I just thought, you know, that's that was his way of saying I like you. I I I I I, I do. I like you. And uh, and and then we worked together on that record. <clears throat> we went to New York and we we did more work on that record. Yep. And then. Uh, um, and then I was in London, and he invited me to uh, the townhouse studio in London, and he was he was making a record which became called Exposure. So okay. 
he had some something pre-recorded and he said jerry just go go in the studio i'm gonna play something play anything you want play it play, play whatever you want play play whatever beat drum beat you do do it do do whatever you want so that's what i did and and uh and then we did various things after that um yeah i, I really enjoyed and then i i realized that robert Fripp was not the, quite the same guy that people thought he was you know um and i'll tell you a very funny story about robert yeah, well, we were in, when we were in Holland, the, our tour manager, Richard McPhail, and Robert and I went out to a rock club out in, this isn't in a, a big city, this is out in the country. We went to a club, in, and it was big, and it was packed full of people, packed, and big club. And there was a band playing, and the name of the band was Vitesse. Vitesse, and they were amazing. Two guitars, bass, and drums, and you know the two guitar players. And it was like, it was like you know almost speed, you know, like kind of speed metal, but funky. And and so they take a break, and a guy comes and finds us, and 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 he's involved with the band, and he said, oh. The guys in the band they wanted they they didn't know who I was. This was a long time ago, but but um they said the guys in the band wanted to know if you want to sit in with the band, they to, with Robert to sit in. And, and Robert was like, Oh no, that's very kind, thank you. But no, he, he, I no. And so that guy leaves. And Robert turned to Richard, uh, the tour manager, and and me, and he and he said, he said this. On a bad night, either one of those guitar players could mop the floor with me. And I know, I I was, know what you mean. And and it was like this is you know because he's like this icon, this mysterious you know genius guitar player. So you know, honestly, Claudio, when people say stuff like that, it makes me love them. I love them when people are genuine. You know. And I'm telling you, the guitar players, they played a completely different style from him. But yeah. they were so badass. These two guys, they were both, I think they were both Dutch. Um, and and they were they were it was an awesome band, you know. It was it was a great night, but I was just like just made me like him even more because I didn't know him at all. It was like a mystery. But to hear yeah. him say that Absolutely. either one yeah. of Either one of those guitar players on a bad night <laughs> could, could mop the floor with me. I thought, yeah. I whether it's true or not doesn't matter. But I just love this exactly. guy for being, honest, for being honest like that. Yeah, Robert Fripp sometimes, and I have talked to several people that have played with with him, and he come across like um, I never I never met him, right? So I have interviewed the folks that play with King Crimson and. Uh, he came across like an arrogant guy, difficult to approach, very English guy, full of himself. Maybe once you cross the barrier, maybe it's a different road trip. I don't know. I never met the guy, but he, of course, I, I admire him and I like King Queens or like many, many bands, but he came across that way. Maybe, maybe he's different once you get to know the guy or at the time, at the time, you know, when he was young with you guys and I, Maybe he was like that, you know. I don't know. So, but I, I admire the guy, right? I I uh, I, I admire musician for being musician, whether they're up themselves or arrogant or this or that or womanized or they do booze, drugs. That's different. I I I take I I like I admire musician to, for being musician, you know. So I I don't I don't worry too much about the personality. And by the way, I have interviewed Richard McPhail. I'm I'm a friend with him as well. So he he he. <laughs> He sent his regard as well. Richard I'm gonna I'm gonna see Richard in about a month. Yeah. You going to uh you going to London or he's coming? No, he's coming here and we're gonna do uh we're gonna do I'm gonna do the radio thing with him and uh the radio show that he and has. I'm gonna set up a, a presentation because now he's doing he's doing like a presentation with his book, you know. With, yeah, yeah, yeah. With slides and music and stuff, you know, talking about that period of time and Genesis and Peter a lot, a lot. Right. So, 
Yeah, yeah. I love no. it. Richard's great. I love Richard. Yeah, he's a good guy. So after that, right? So you end up finish the the second label, the second album. I think I toured the fourth album. I don't know if you end up meeting for Peter Gabriel three. I think uh, Steve and I don't know if Phil Collins was there involved in that. That that right or What's for that? Peter Gabriel the third album. Uh, well, yeah, Phil played on some of the stuff. Yeah, and Phil Collins was involved in that one as well, right? You end up meeting yeah, I mean, the guy, or oh uh, yeah, well, Phil's great. Phil was involved, and I think, I think what well, I, I mean, not to take anything away from Phil, but but Peter and I had developed a really good relationship, and he really liked. I my playing is very different than Phil's, That's um, right, yeah. and so, but I think what was one of the things that was happening was I couldn't always be there. You know, if I was busy and Peter, I was to do something. Or he, he did a couple of gigs, I think, and he did them with Phil and other guys, you know, um, just because uh, we were busy. But um, Phil played on Intruder. Um, and I don't know what else he played on. But, yeah, I mean, I played on, I think, for the most part, I was always the drummer or it always... Yeah. Wanted to be, he always wanted me to be the drummer, but sometimes, so I started to get busy with other other people, like oh, all yeah. else. So I could I couldn't always be available. I tried to, I tried cool. to be available, but I I couldn't always be available. And I'm quite sure you have great memories of. You just mentioned before a couple of minutes ago how you end up working with Hall and Oates, and that was your your music days, the stuff that you were grew up with black music and so forth. So you were in heaven at the time, right? And how you how you manage, yeah. you know, Peter calling you back, Hall and Oath calling you back, and later on Paul McCartney calling you back. And you know, you need to divide the scale. So I think I read somewhere that people were accommodating their scale according to your scale. So you know but certainly Paul and Paul and Oates and Peter were. Yeah. For wow. a couple of years. I, I was going back and forth. I I finished a tour with Hall and Oates in, in Tokyo. Right. And and I flew to England. Um, it was actually my birthday. I flew to England and, and I went out to, to Bath where Peter had the place for us to stay. And, yeah. and and I waited for everybody to get up to start rehearsing for a tour with Peter. My God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those days are over. I... No, that hasn't happened in a long time. But I back then it was, you know, it was, I was in, I was very sought after. I guess I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I was. Uh, I don't know what to say. People were, people wanted me to. They wanted me to, get, to hire me. You're, you're you're good at what you do, man. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm pretty good. I'm, I mean, I do I do what I do, and I think. I think uh, I try. I try to do my, you know, I try to uh, to try to add uh, to contribute. I don't mm. know. But those were and, great days. Great. And then, and then after you end up, so eventually you needed to make a decision without going to Peter Gable or staying with Paul and Oates. And I read somewhere that even Paul and Oates ask you, you know, point blank, what would you like? What would it take for you to stay without change the name of the band, money, music right? Just name it, let's put it right, and then you stay without and, and you say, No, but I'm going to with Peter That quite sure that was a very difficult decision, you know. So I didn't even think about it. Really? Um and it, it's weird because I I I for for reasons for of my own, yeah. um you know, I had felt an allegiance and a loyalty to Peter. Yeah. Even though, in in the end, he didn't remain loyal to me. To, to you, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, which is is sad and unfortunate, but um, but I I was loyal to Peter. I didn't I I didn't want to leave Peter, and 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 Daryl and John were pretty much offering me. I could write my own ticket. I I would have been a multimillionaire now if I had just stayed with them. But I wasn't very smart when it came to business because it wasn't about business. So I didn't have anybody to help me. I didn't have anybody to guide me. I didn't do the right thing. I didn't, I didn't actually, in that moment in time, 
get Hall and Oates to make me an offer and have someone negotiate, a manager on my part, to 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 negotiate with them and then come to me and say, look, you could stay with Peter, but here's what Daryl and John are offering you. And you never have that. You never you didn't have like a manager or they're offering you a piece of what uh, you know to be part of what they're doing, like a yeah. percentage of what they're doing. No, I never yeah. had that. I never had that. I still don't. I've had new, new there have been a, a couple of moments, key moments in my life where I'm I'm I I decided on I, I made decisions based on my 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 feet, you know, my loyalty and my feeling like my my mother and father raised me like that. They raised me like that. They they didn't raise a businessman. Now my brother Rick, my older brother, is all about business, all about business. And that's why he's a multimillionaire. And I'm not at all about business. And he also doesn't play the drums anymore. And he hasn't for probably 20, 30 years. I mean, he moved into scoring music, scoring and he and he he won he won the lottery with the show called Everybody Loves Raymond. He he wrote this the theme and he he scored that show and he made a lot of money from that. Um but my I I'm just a drummer. I'm I'm a player. You know, I mean, I my my real uh, deep love is to do production. I, I've produced various artists, you know, and records. I'm, I like that. Not not I never wanted to be a session drummer. I, and really, mostly, most of all, what I've, I've only ever wanted to do is be in a band. Uh, I just want to be. I always want to be in a band, and that's. I was in Orleans. I was a band. And then I joined Peter. For 10 years, it really was like a band. I mean, it was Tony, Larry, me, Peter, and then the guitar players shit, you know, changed until David became the guitar player. And, yeah. and, and it was really like a band. But <laughs> so as as far as Hola knows, I mean you play in X Studies, Voices, some of Private Eyes. And, those, and Private Eyes, yeah. Uh, private Eyes, those are the, the who know was doing very well at the time. And, you well, know, so a after voices, Hall and Oates' career, they were huge, and yeah, then they and made then a they went down. They, yeah, they went down. That's when I joined. I started playing with them. We were playing clubs. We, we were playing clubs, and they had been playing big places. You know, they had Sarah Smile, Rich Girl, She's Gone, all before me. Yeah. <laughs> and then. Uh, I don't know. They made a record. I, I want to say it was Beauty on a Backstreet Beat. They made a record that didn't do well. And so um, and so I joined. The, that's when I joined them. We recorded. And it's interesting because that Voices record, the producer was a guy named David Foster. I don't know if you know David Foster. No, no, I don't. I don't. Oh, well, David Foster. Look him up sometime. I mean, he I became look the up. most... The most successful songwriter producer in the music business for probably twenty years. Like he wow. he wrote he wrote um, at the time he was kind of a young guy, up and coming guy. But he wrote um, he had a song that was a hit that he wrote that um, Earth Wind and Fire. Then he produced Chicago. He produced Peter Cetera. Then he produced. He was doing like Celine Dion and Bocelli, and I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I'm only scratching the surface. I'm scratching the surface. I mean, he became the one of the most successful producer writers because he writes. He would write all of that. He was a songwriter and a producer, and he was incredibly talented. But he did the Voices record. He did the um, Ecstatic record. I think okay. was it David Ecstatic. And then we did voices. I don't remember if it was. I think it was uh, when they got a guy I actually re recommended, an engineer who and became the engineer producer. I I recommended a guy because um, uh, I think David was you know at that point he was he was just too, too busy. He's working with everybody, everybody. Literally, when you get, when we're done, go go Google David Foster. Uh yeah. And you, you're gonna be, you're not even gonna believe what his credits are. So um and uh and so and voices ecstatic had a song called Wait for Me, which was kind of a mo a moderate hit. 
<laughs> and then we did boy, uh, Voices had a song called Your Kisses on My List. Oh, and yeah, that I, was, know, I, know the, I know that band very well. So. That was a bigger hit. And yeah. and, may, and maybe, um, what was the other one? Um, uh, uh, you Make My Dreams Come True. That was on one of those records. That, that was another one we did together, and that was a big hit. Um, and and then they just took off from there. And in the 80s, after I was not playing with them anymore, they were huge. They were probably playing stadiums. They were huge. Yeah. Um, wow. And... And uh, that's great for them. I'm glad, and I, I I missed I missed playing with them, but I felt an allegiance to Peter. Um, it was more of a challenge to some degree with Peter. You know, it was, it was very different. You know, and it, it was evolving. Every record was he he did he wanted it to be totally. Each record was different. He didn't want to do the same thing twice. So I I I, I liked that. It was so it was it wasn't always like with. With Hall and Oates, I'll only put it to you this way: When I started working with Peter, if there were any girls in the audience, they were they were only there because their boyfriends made them come. Yeah, and there were I, and there were very few, very few. <laughs> when but then with Hall and Oates, I mean, it was all about it was like you know it was very sexual music. I remember there'd be I'd be playing. We'd be playing, looking out, and there were girls with it. That the, it was like they got dressed to come to the show, but just forgot to put their dress on. So yeah. it's like they were in their underwear. <laughs> I mean, it was. I know. I know what was, you mean, man. Yeah. It was the whole, the total, complete opposite. Um, at, back at that time, you know, Peter's music was like it was a, uh, it was a um, an extension of. The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, you know, rail, you know, the yeah. leather jackets, guys who had leather jackets and the, you yeah. know, they were tough guys, you know, all in all, it was, it was just all about, all about pop, you know, cool, good pop, sex, you know, sexy, you know, sultry, you know, sensual, I don't know, whatever, you know, you know. Was, yeah, was I know what you mean. Have so, you, a kind of person, thank you, a kind of personal question. Did you ever have like a conversation with Peter toward the end, like a closure and say, Jerry, I'm, I want to do take two years off. I want to do different thing, go with a different style. No. Or eventually you, they never call you back and you never call him back. And no. Uh, yeah. We're, 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 uh, we're not, we're not, we don't stay in touch with one another and we haven't because been, here's what I think happened. There were, we were going in to do the next record, which was going to be. So it wasn't called. Yeah. So yet. And and we I had the um the schedule was worked out. Like let's say in April it was going to be with Peter. In May, I was I was doing a record with Paul McCartney. Yeah. Well, at the last minute, Peter changed his plan and his record was in May at the same time as McCartney's record. And I didn't really feel like I could bail on the McCartney record because the McCartney record was It was just Paul, Eric Stewart, who was, he had a band called 10CC. I know them, yeah, very well. And he yeah, and yeah. Paul had been around, and me, it was just the three of us. Wow. And and Hugh Padgham was the guy who hired me. He was producing and engineering it. And he, I, I just didn't feel like I could I could blow them off, you know? And you're I, a man of your work, so you're... I, I think, I think, I don't know, I think Peter might have taken that as a slap in the face because this is pre so so he was popular but not like after so he became you know back then every like two years somebody made a record that was the biggest record in the world and and like around then back then it was like before peters it was it might have been um you two you know like a u2 record that was like Sold 15, 20, 25 million, 30 million records worldwide. And and they were the big, that were the, and then Peter had that that moment in time. And, and so made him a huge star. But that was not why I didn't, I didn't do Peter's re record because I felt like I had an obligation to, uh, to do the Paul record. And I, you know, other than that, I don't know. To be honest with you, 
Peter and I had always had, he was always competitive with me, Peter. You know, he was kind of like a closet drummer. You know, I don't want to get into too much personal stuff, but, you know, he grew up in England and it, it, and he married Jill and had, who like I, he'd known, they, they'd known each other since they were young. And I was this crazy Italian-American maniac who was, you know, living the, the, the life. Dream. Drugs, yeah. sex, and rock and roll, baby. And... <laughs> And also, I was playing drums. I, I don't know. I think there was a. I was singing. I could sing. I mean, I, 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 I was doing all kinds of different things. And I, I don't know. I can't speak for Peter. I think he. I think I also just. I, I never, I never was very diplomatic. You know, I if I think if I feel something, I say it. And sometimes you have to be. That, that can that can um, that can hurt you, and I wasn't caught careful. I mean, I just was always straight with Peter, and I, if I didn't like something he was doing, or I, I, I would I would call him on it. I think I I just um, I don't know. I can't speak for him. And to be very honest with you, um, I wish I had known that like be. But when I had the choice between Hall and Oates and Peter, if I had known then, I would have been happy to just st stay with Hall and Oates. But this was this was was a few years after that. So um, anyway, I, I I have a lot of respect for Peter, and I I I had I I I, I cherish the the time that I spent working with him, and I learned a lot. He really turned me around. About my the approach to making music was very very different. You know, and, no, good. and uh, that that searching and for trying to do something different, you know, and the security, not the security record. If you know the record, I, I do. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I feel like the security record was in a way that was the pinnacle of his creativity. I mean, family in the fishing net, San Jacinto, Wallflower. Um, I, I don't know. I kept trying to think. Um. Rhythm of the Heat, Flood maybe I was on. I don't know if Flood was on that, but you know it was, you know, Family in the Fishing Net. It wasn't rock music. There were songs and said that they weren't rocks. It wasn't rock and roll. It was something very different beyond rock and roll. And uh, so I, uh, and and I and then you know when So came around, I did I when I was working with Paul in England at Paul's studio. When when I had time, I would go to Bath and and do some sessions working on Peter's record. You know, I was going back and forth. Um, wow! So I ended up playing on like Red Rain and some other things. But at that point, Peter, you know, when I started playing with Peter, there were no computers. There was no, dip, you know, there wasn't a digital thing. It was, you know, we had to figure out what we were doing, and we had to do it on twenty four channels, maybe forty eight. But but I think that. By the time um, so came around, and and afterwards, the technology got to a point where there was, it was overwhelming. I mean, and I think in, in my opinion is it's in some ways it's hurt him. This is why it would take him years and years and years to make a record, and he had too many options, you know. And he was experimenting with, you know, when we worked, we were like a band and we were working it out together. Um, eventually, it got to a point where. You could send files to anybody and have them, and have them uh, try to contribute to it. And I think it got a little confusing. I I seem to remember having a com conversation with Peter at one point when I was at Real World years later working on another record, and and I saw him and we we talked and I, you know, I was I was, was I resented the what happened. You know, I mean, musically, I wasn't devastated. You know, especially coming from my background, I wasn't devastated. But what's funny is the soul record. When Peter said to me, "I'm going for a different feel," what after the soul record, and he was going to get another drummer to play with him, tour Manu. I, it, Manu what's ironic? You, right? Manu, yeah. what, what What's ironic is that music was really my. That's what I grew up on. Wheelhouse, I mean, you know. Yeah, right. exactly, exactly. So. 
He, yeah, he didn't matter. He said he was trying to get find another field, a different field. Uh, that's bullshit. He just he had enough of me, our relationship, and I just think he wanted to get somebody. But I also, if you want to keep talking about Peter, I remember well, he was doing an interview with someone, and I was sitting there listening, and, and, and he was talking about the process of doing the security record. And he had been listening to shortwave radio in Africa and Middle Eastern music, and he was being influenced by all this stuff. And and this, I think he was an English guy, and he was a bit of a dickhead. But but he said, "Don't you feel a little guilty that your four white guys, four upper class white guys, explo- like exploiting the music of of um, like ethnic music of blacks and Africans and blah blah." blah. And and you know what, Claudio. In my mind, I thought things are about to change. Things are about to change. And so uh, he, I'm not taking anything away from Manu, but he is black. And he had another black, you know, the David Sank. He got some black, or some black David, guys in the band. David, David Sanchez, right? Who played the game. There was, yeah. there was a girl, the girl, uh, Paula Cole. Paula Cole, right. You know, he, 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 like, basically, he 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 mixed it up um and i i'm not making any excuses i i promise you it's peter's decision to do whatever he wanted but i think sure. these these are all were all they were all factors um so yeah it was no your to your original question did we have a discussion no yeah no he he was i i think he was angry and re, and he was he resented me and i think he that's what he did. He he kind of he kind of got he pun he got back at me or punished me or whatever um by letting me go. Because I mean, look, let's face it, the music it didn't change that much. I mean, and certainly with my background, I mean he didn't say, Hey, I want to go more in like an R and B kind of black thing. Do you think you can do that? I mean, do you do you have any sense of that? He didn't we didn't have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Especially um, after I'm, you know, I'm, you were loyal to him, right? And after yeah. like a relationship where you broke up with a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, after 10 years, you need to have a sense of closure, right? That's what people do or should do, in my opinion, right? That's what I would do, right? As opposed to, well, I'll call you, I'll never call you, and you never call him back. Oh, it's, 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 yeah, no, know. he he didn't that there was nothing no. after that. I Sure. I think I, I remember he dropped me off. We were in London. He drove me out to Bath. He was going to he was going to Bath, and he gave me a ride. And he in the car we had this conversation, and and he said, "I'm I'm gonna get I'm getting another drummer. I'm gonna go for another feel or whatever." Um, yeah. And and he dropped me off at my a friend of mine's house, um, who my, my one of my close friends, a guy named Manny Elias, who's a drummer and was the drummer in the band Tears for Fears. For years, wow. um, and so I was at Manny's house, and I was very close with him and his family. But I remember I was very, very upset. I was crying. I started crying because it was like, you know, it was like, like you said, we we're breaking up or a relationship. Take, take, ten years with somebody as a friend or a cousin or a boyfriend or whatever. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. How 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 is it to to play with uh, Paul McGarnett? I mean, the guy. Of course, yeah. everybody knows, it, but yeah, Paul was great. It was great. I mean, I I can't remember how long, how much time I spent with him. Weeks, a month, more. Uh, I, I I got along great with Paul. I thought he was really good, and you know, it was fun making that record. Eric Stewart's also really great, and the three of us were, you know, we were just going in. And I'll tell you, it's funny. The first day of the session, we go in, we we're set up, we're playing, play a song, play it few times keep playing thing lots of breaks tea talking hanging out going outside coming back play blah 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 um and he paul really worked like school hours because he's had all, all of his kids were young and and so we you know we probably worked from like maybe 10 11 o'clock until maybe four four or five o'clock you know and so we played the song and i'm used to getting it pretty quickly i'm pretty quick um Especially what he was doing, because it wasn't like Peter searching for some, some you know, un- another way. sound or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So 
uh, we go through the first day and and then we went home and they come back the next day and we start playing the same song again and after a couple of times i i we took a break to have tea or whatever and i said I said to paul listen um if i'm not doing a good job like if i'm not getting the job done you know i i, I don't want to you know i don't just i'm it's fine if you want to get another drummer and and he said jerry you're fine you're doing great you're it's all good he said but you have to understand i'm not doing i'm not looking for like what's the best take i'm just i just want to play i mean and it's kind of what he did with the Beatles. It's just like he he's a band guy. He doesn't like at that time, he didn't he wasn't trying to get an agenda like, okay, let's get this song done and then this one and this one. He said, I just want to play. And and Claudio, every song that we recorded, we played for three days. Every song took three days. Three days of playing it, not took three days, but through we played it for three days. And we had tons of takes, tons of takes. And then we moved on to the next song. And and we worked like Monday through Friday. And uh, that was a funny, interesting experience. And, you know, I just settled in and I was there, kind of, I was there for a while. And yeah. I'll tell you a funny thing. Linda McCartney grew up in the next town over from where I grew up. So... She thought of me. We were like family. She thought, "Oh, Jerry, you know, you know where where I'm from and where she's from. We, we were like next next door to each other." And I didn't know her, but but that that she was very into that into that whole thing, and and we got along really well. She never came to the studio. She had nothing to do with the recording. Um, and but what's funny is at the time, my girlfriend was an actress and she had been in done a movie called Airplane and she was the star of the movie she was it was a huge movie you know you, I don't know if you've ever seen it but it's like a comedy and she's a, a stewardess and, and yeah okay yeah yeah, like yeah this is back in, this is back in the 80s and so yeah. Julie Haggerty she's my she was my girlfriend then she came to England to hang out for a few weeks with me and so when we would go over to the McCarthy's, McCartney's for dinner, you know, we'd hang out and have the dinner, you know, we'd watch watch TV, watch a movie. Um, and and the other thing was the the some of the couple of the kids I had worked with a group, the group Tear Fears. I toured with them and I did some recording with them that ended up on the record, the songs from the Big Chair. Well. The the kids were big Tears for Fears fans, and then then I show up. I walk in with Julie, who's this woman who's in like had was the star of one of the biggest movies at the time. So what was kind of funny in a weird way was in the McCartney household, Julie and I were more famous than Paul and Linda because <laughs> Paul and Linda Paul and Linda were their parents. I mean, they're their parents. This is sure. this is my 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 impression. Thinking back on it, was that they you know uh, they, they 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 knew. I mean, they knew Paul was famous, but but it was also their father, and so that was a very funny kind of kind of like turnaround. Um, so that was a great experience. I really enjoyed working with Paul, and then eventually, when the record was done, we did. Um, I did a video. We, we we went out to like Arizona and shot a video for for, for uh, Paul's for the single Strangled yep. from the record. So I got to see them again. I got to hang out with them again. And Linda was there. She had I think she had the kids, of course. And it was probably in the summer, and the kids were probably on on holiday. So yeah, yeah. We we we, we um and that was good. It's good. Another, another another week together hanging out. How, how is it to work with uh, Stevie Nicks and Cher? What memory do you have? Well, with Stevie, did you say yeah. Stevie and Cher? Okay, yeah. Let's start with two Stevie. different people. Yeah, yeah. Stevie Nicks. I didn't really work with her. What happened was they oh. she was working with Rupert Hine, producer. Yeah, yeah. They recorded this record, and they had done it all like in, they rented a mansion somewhere and they recorded everything with a drum machine. <laughs> in the end. 
at the end, they wanted to put re real drums on it. So they got, I got the call to come in and, pl and play on that record, which was great. Great record. Mm. Rupert, I guess Rupert hired me. So I went into a studio in LA and I, I, I just, we just blew through the songs. Um, like in two days, I just played on pretty much most, most of the record. I don't know, most of the record, I'm sure. But, um, uh, and it was great, but she did come to the studio for a few hours on the second day. She came to the studio. Yeah, so wow. I, I got to, got to kind of meet her and, and hang out and talk to her. And, and, uh, the only thing, I mean, I look, I'm a huge Fleetwood Mac fan. R the so rumor, yeah. Rumors is a record that's that I still think very there's very few records can top rumors and, and you know and you put it on listen to it it sounds like it could have been made yesterday it doesn't I, sound like doesn't sound like it was made in the 70s it sounds yep. like so but I the thing is I asked her how did they manage to stay together because she had a solo career Christine McVie had a solo career and Lindsey Buckingham had, a, they were all had sexual successful solo careers. And I was like, how do you guys, what kept you together? How, how? And she said, Jerry, nobody would take responsibility for breaking up the band. Like if any one of us had quit the band, we felt it, they, we all felt like it would be the end of the band. Um, Ironically, Christine McVie did quit. She did quit the band. Uh, yeah. And, and, they, and they did keep going. And then she rejoined the band many years later. <laughs> but um, I thought that was interesting. So, so that was Stevie. And and then, um, so it's good. I mean, we didn't get to spend day in and day out working on music and hanging out together. <clears throat> but it was a great record. It was a great record to, to, to play on. And then, but did you ask me about Cher? Yeah, yes. Well, the Cher record was a whole different story. I mean, we I I had moved up to Woodstock, New York from the city. I was living in Woodstock and there were there was there were a couple of studios there, residential, you know, country residential studios. One one of them was called Bearsville. The other one is called Dreamland, which I now run. Um yeah. and I'm partners with the guy who started the stu the studio in the, in the mid '80s. But so I was working. <clears throat> I worked a bit with a, a guy named Desmond Child, who was a songwriter and producer. I don't know if you know who he is, but but I can tell you, he became very successful as a songwriter, and he he wrote he co-wrote like like um, living on a prayer and. He co-wrote like some Bon Jovi hits, and he co-wrote a bunch of Aerosmith hits, and then he co-wrote. He was he was a writer, songwriter slash producer, but he was really a great writer, and he was producing the Cher record. And so they came to, to Woodstock where I was living, and we 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 made the record in in that the in Bearsville Studios. Cher was amazing. I mean. I mean, if anybody has, if anybody had a reason to be a diva and like, will, like feel like they were a holier than everybody else, she does because she's she's like a megastar, a megastar. And working with her in the studio, she was incredible. She she we the, we had the band go in, we we play the song. She went in the vocal booth and sang her ass off. And she, she was like a complete and total professional. Didn't I remember I was listening back to a take in the control room and she she was kind of standing near 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 me. She was near me a lot for some reason. I um as it turns out back way back then, I think she she kind of had a little bit of a crush on me, you know. In wow. my in my in my much younger days, and 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 uh, so, but she was and I and we're listening to a take, and I and everybody's talking, and I said to her, "What do you think? I mean, what what, what are you uh, you know? How is this? Are you are you are you, are you have any com any comments or anything?" And she said, she "said Jerry, you're here for a reason. You guys are here to do your job, and you know what you're doing. 
you don't need me to tell you. I mean, I'm, I'm, you just do your thing and I'm going to do my thing. And, and, uh, and that's what we're going to do. And, and I love that. I thought that was great. So I really enjoyed working on that record a lot. And she's an incredible talent, incredible. And so laid back and so low key, no, no attitude, no, no, no ego, no, nothing. Just like, she's just like one of the band members. Um, my God, man. And 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 uh, Desmond was such a Desmond Child, the guy who wrote, produced. He was such a great guy and such a such a super sweet, nice, you know, warm, easygoing. I mean, and and great writer. And you know, he just he, he, you know his thing was you know just get the right people in, and that makes his job very easy. You know, yeah. I like Jerry the way Jerry plays. I like his approach. Then Jerry, get Jerry. You know, um, and and it was very similar, very interesting. Um, I, I, at the time, I that same year I worked with McCartney. I think it was in that same year that I ended up working on the uh, the record Spike, uh, which was um, Elvis Costello. Yeah. And and uh, so I, I I went into the studio. Um, I got to the studio early in, in Los Angeles, Ocean Lane, and T-Bone Burnett, who was the producer who I had worked with on other projects, he said, oh, hey, hey, Murata. He's called Murata, Murata. You know, Elvis, I'm not really that excited about having you play on the record. But uh, but just, I know what you're going to do. I, I, know, I know that in the end, he's going to be very, he'll be happy with what you do. I'm sure of it. And which was kind of funny because it didn't exactly make me feel super confident going in and playing. Exactly. That's so right. <laughs> Elvis, uh, I'll tell you what, in the end, of what I think happened. So the first song, they and they did the same thing. They had the record recorded with a drum machine, and, they, and I was just going in and overdubbing drums. Yeah. So put the first song up, and I go into the studio, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I'm – I have like a metal chair sitting next to me and I'm banging on stuff and I'm playing around. <coughs> you know, I'm, <coughs> excuse me. I'm, I'm doing what I do, which is a little bit like left of center. Um, but, but grooving, you know, grooving well. And, and so, you know, I, I did a take a couple takes or whatever. It didn't take much to go in the control room. Listen back. Elvis was like, Oh, okay, good. Let's move on next song so he put up they put up the next song play me the song and i said to him do you have anything in mind i mean you what do you Sorry, what do you think do you um what 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 do you well, what are you thinking about uh any ideas and he said he said to me jerry i can't tell you what to do you know what to do. I I already know you know what to do. You don't you don't need me to tell you what I think you should do. And and that's the way we the whole the, I went through that whole record uh, in two days, seven or eight songs. What's funny is when when I was working with McCartney that that earlier that year, he was talking about how his people people wanted him to get together with Elvis Costello right to write songs together, which to me made kind of sense because in a way, you know, Lennon had been killed. You know, this was, he was, he was gone. And, and I think Elvis kind of had a similar, a similar kind of swagger and cheekiness. You know what I mean? Like his, the way he wrote and his, his thing. so I think they thought that this is, they needed Paul to get together with someone who would be like a foil, like that, you know, they like they didn't it didn't seem like it would work together, but but it, but it was magic, and but um, Paul, it, it, Paul was saying I don't know that it's never really happened. It just didn't happen. Didn't happen. So when I started working with Elvis, yeah, it, on the on his record, as it turns out, there were a couple of songs, including Veronica, which was the big hit, that they co-wrote together. And I said to him, <laughs> I said, how did you end up, tell me about the McCartney 
connection because I know when he I was working with him, he, he his there were people that were really trying to get you guys together, but they didn't. You were not responding. You were not. You were not. You, you know. You were doing it. And and he said to me, Jerry, I write on my own. I don't co-write with people. I just write songs myself. I'm not. A, I don't co-write. <clears throat> this is back at the time. And 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 uh, I said, well, so what happened? And he said, well, you know, they kept trying to get me to write with Paul, and eventually, I he said, you know, sometimes there are these songs that we've got that. You never can finish. Like I, I kept going back to them, but I could never really finish them. So he said, "I figured, why don't I give him a couple of those songs? Because what do I have to lose? I mean, I'm, That's I'm right. not, yeah. I'm not finishing them. Maybe Paul can. So yeah. think probably thinking that it was not going to go anywhere. So he sends the song to Paul. He said Paul made some comments. We spoke. He made some changes. He did his thing and sent it back. And he said I really liked what he did." I'm just, I, I just really liked what he did. So I, so I sent him another song, and we, and we co-wrote another song together. So that was kind of an interesting period, and for me to be in the middle of that, you know, like because I had been working with Paul, then I was working with Elvis, and uh, and uh, so it's funny, kind of a funny story. Absolutely. You do you miss playing live within a band or? Touring stuff like that, or yeah, I mean, I I I have done a lot of live playing. Yeah. Um. Less these not less these days. Ironically, yeah. I don't know. Maybe eight years ago, something like there was a point where somebody had been for years had been kind of approaching me about going out and doing the, the music from security, doing like Peter Gabriel, doing. Yeah. Uh, Like Gabriel music, but not with Peter. Yeah. Well, um, like a tribute, tribute band for a, you know. Yeah, Peter. and back then they weren't even tribute bands. I don't know. They just thought, you know, That's... um, and especially they were very into the security record. And after so, you know, the, a lot of that stuff that Peter got known for after so with Big Time and Sledgehammer and Steam and digging, and it was all like it was kind of they were more pop on poppy, and 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 he wasn't playing. I don't know how much you can play that stuff live. Um, Family in the Fishing Net and San Jacinto and, and that stuff. So they, 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 I think there were people that just wanted to hear it perform. So I didn't want to do it. And I said no numerous times. But eventually the guy, the, the guy who was trying to get it to happen said, well, Trey Gunn said he'd be interested in doing it if you'll do it. And then I, that got me interested. And the point of all this is that eventually we put this band together And we went out and we and we played Gabriel music, um, and it was fantastic. I, I mean, I was in, I was in heaven. I loved it, um, and I love playing live. But I still play live. I mean, I'm playing live tonight. It's a it's a show like a Broadway show, but but oh, it's, yeah. But it's a but it's great. It's a musical, and the Anthony Rapp is amazing. You know, he's one of the the original stars from the show Rent on Broadway, and. And he's much deeper than a, than a Broadway performer singer. It's great. So, I mean, I just love playing live. I love. I'm kind. Of, I guess. I guess uh, to some degree, I'm an exhibitionist. I like playing in front of people. I like being in front of people. Like getting that that energy back. And I've done. I I toured with the Indigo Girls, um, another band that I played with and recorded with at, yeah. in the '90s, wow. yeah, and the, wow. and then the Tony Tony Levin band, and we played a whole bunch of stuff and made some records and. And uh, and then I was recording with like Sarah McLaughlin and you know wow. uh, all, I, I, all kinds of different people. I don't even remember the, the you know Robbie Robertson, uh, Suzanne Vega. Uh, wow. I just started doing uh, doing tons and tons of records and, and touring, uh, touring, touring. Uh, you know, touring. I liked to tour. I enjoyed touring. I like playing live. Um, you know, you get on stage. You play for two hours. There's no stopping and discussing what you did or what you're doing or what somebody else should do. You know what I mean? It's like you get out there and you just play the music and 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 just let it let it rip. So I I do like that a lot and I I miss it, but I do play. I mean, I still play. Not haven't been doing like arenas and stadiums very much lately, but 
but I don't care because I still, I just enjoy playing music. And then, um, of course, because you brought it up, um, like I've done for years, I've been working with Eric, uh, Eric Taylor and Rupert, um, That's right. Rupert Greenell. We have a, a group called the Fragile Fate. Um, and so we've been putting, we've been doing that for years, just making music and mostly not releasing any of it. And then, about two years ago, I guess, Eric Eric thought it would be a great idea to send this guy, David Helpling. I didn't know who he was, but yeah, Eric, yeah. Eric knew him and knew his his history. And he thought this is a good idea. Let's send stuff to, to David. And David, David just took the music to a whole nother level and a different direction. I mean, yeah. very different to what Rupert and Eric and I do instinctively david did he turned it into something different which is good which mm. otherwise we're doing the same thing over and over again so um so that's for the most part that's kind of where i'm at today i mean I've are you going to be touring that uh, with the four guys i know david i interviewed him he's a very nice guy as well david's great you did interview him. you interviewed david yeah i did he's a very nice person Great and I, guy, smart and talented, but he's he doesn't really want a tour. No, no, and he yeah. The rest of can, us do, but he doesn't. Yeah, he's, he he, he's he may. Part of the He's very have a couple of kids. He's part of the sported pickery family. Different type of music, right? Like you guys play, but it. Um, I think would be interested to. I think you guys can do well, you know, if you kind of you know set up. You know, ten gigs to begin with, and see how it goes. And I think you we'll, big names, I, I, so you... I think I think we'll convince him. I think maybe we'll we should talk him. to him. <laughs> maybe you should talk to him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Or, he's, uh... or maybe I should have some, a couple of my Italian cousins go pay him a visit. That's right. <laughs> and, and, and make him an offer that he can't refuse. He can refuse. Yeah. Yeah. No, I th I'm kidding. I think we'll. No, I don't. I think he'll come around. It's, it's a massive undertaking trying to recreate this music. But like I said yeah. to him, you know, you know what it was like trying to reproduce a Gabriel record that we spent like a couple of years making with synths and all, see, you know, all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah. To, to 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 boil that down to the the five of us, four of us, five of us, um recreating that music but we did it we did it and i i, I I'll, I'll 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 convince david that you know it's, it's probably because i would love that because that's what i love to do i love i love recording producing mostly playing on sessions i've done it so much and many times it's it's just not fun because the music's not that great and uh but i i i um i I, I love producing because I like I like to help like yeah. um, like being the director of that's what Peter was like with us He's like the director of a film you know um, I, and so I love I love production but I do love playing live I do and I do love I love playing live uh, where the music can be well I love it all I mean I play gigs with a trio in a restaurant you know like. Like a, a bebop kind of thing. I love that. Piano, bass, upright bass, drums. I mean, mm. I, I'm, I love that. And I, I'm playing in a, I have a, I play in a group um, called Annie and the Hedonists. And they're incredible. We do all of this music like that dates back to the early 1900s, like Sister Rosetta Tharp, um, uh, you know, uh, oh God. Um, Sippy Wallace, uh, Louis Armstrong. It's like swing music, swing, swing dancing. Music. But great musicians, great people, so much fun. So and I all just almost all I do is play brushes, you know. And uh, but it's so much fun, and the music's so spirited. Um, Laverne Baker, you know, it's all like thirties, for Billy Holiday, you know, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties. Then we do like something. Some kind of something from the sixties, um, White Rabbit. We do White Rabbit, um, you know, the Jefferson Airplane song, and um, yeah. it's just it's just so much fun, so much fun. Great musicians, great people, 
And I love that. I mean, I don't, I don't make a fortune doing that, you know, but you know, I don't know. I, I, this is what I do. I, I, I'm a, I play music. You like Dreamland, running Dreamland and seeing, being, you know, sometimes like a producer, sometimes not, and people, bands come in different, um, different weeks uh, for a week there, and then yeah. you help them out with the record or your suggestion you know, or playing the drum for them or, or nothing. I mean, do, do you like most, that kind of stuff? Yeah. Mostly I don't, you know, if people want me to do something, I'm happy to do it, but um, I don't. Band, bands come in, different people come in, um, and, um, but I like it. I, I like it a lot. And I have a studio in my house called Jairsville. Oh, I see. Done a, lot, yeah. done a lot of recording there. Yeah. Well, how about I took over Dreamland, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, because the guy who owns Dreamland in the, in the early 2000s, you know, when Napster and did digital digitizing of music, it oh. basically destroyed the music business. Destroyed it. I mean, who buys a CD now? You don't even, they're not even put CD players in cars anymore. I mean, people are streaming or, you know, 10, 15, 20, even 20 years ago, 15 years, what, you know, if you had a record, a CD of a record and you really, and, and I really liked it, I pop it into my computer and it's, and I have it. It's in my computer. I, uh, yeah. I didn't buy, I didn't buy it. Um, so, but I, I, I like the, I like, having dreamland i like making it better it's an incredible place you know sometime you should come up come come up yeah we need we know. need to organize because i would love to be there for if if you allow me a couple of days and see i say i want to learn more i want to as i said before i want to learn different part of, of of the music and i i told you before i'm going to be attending a seminar the real world studios i went there a couple of weeks i was i was in london actually and and i went to see your friend from the fix so um I don't oh, Rupert you went, to see, me. you went to see Rupert? Uh, yeah, I went to see the fix. A couple of weeks they were playing London. I was there for the Oh, they played in London. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I went to Real World Studios. I saw a great band for um, uh Belgian called Hoover Phonics. I don't know if you know them. They are very good. I saw 10 CC uh the fix. You I saw mean, 10, C, 10 CC playing live? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Eric? Yeah. And and the uh, other guys? Uh, there are three guys, right? So the drummer, the guitar player, and and uh, a Goldman, uh, the three of them. And then they were Jan Hornell, I believe, the fourth guy, and another guy. And they sound very, very good. And actually, 10 CC is going to be touring here in, in the United States in a couple of months. They're playing yeah, nice. in in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and do I think I'm doing a gig in New York. They're they're, they're very good music. As I say before, they, I told you before, I see close to where I live in the border with Maryland and New York, every band comes this way. And I mean literally every band. So I'm able to see I don't know, fifty gigs a year or something. Yeah. So awesome. uh you know, so uh yeah, so uh I went to uh, uh I went to a real world studios was for me very important to be in the place you know i yeah mm -hmm. i knew uh, uh, i know a record engineer that worked there and uh, he showed me around and i spent the whole day and i i want to i want to learn i want to learn cool. yeah that's the way to learn right? so i would love yeah. to sit in a session and then help out in any way i can man man i wish i I wish I I known you twenty years ago, you know, because I would have been your assistant, you know, carrying your drums or whatever, just to meet Cher and Stevie Nicks and Peter Gabriel and Fripp yeah, well, and all this guy. <laughs> I would love to. Well, we'll get you. We'll get you to Dreamland. You can come up and hang out for a couple of days if there's nobody. We have accommodations at the studio for yep for people. That would be great. I appreciate it. If, if there's nobody, if there's nobody. Um, there's nobody staying in the accommodations. Then. Yeah. If no, we'll, stay, we'll, if, if no, we we'll stay in a hotel nearby. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And, uh, but I want to. I want to learn a session. Or or come to my. Or just or come stay with me in my house. My I, I live ten, ten minutes from from Dreamland. Yeah, I appreciate it, man, man. I know you have a, a gig coming up very soon. Yeah, it was very nice talking to you. Hopefully, we'll can meet up very soon. And you know, as I told you, I feel free to come here. 
if you're in DC or in Virginia, you know, have for dinner. And I, I need to talk to David Helpley. I need to convince the guy. You need, you guys, I think the album is, I think the one single is going to be released today or tomorrow, right? But yeah. the album mm -hmm. is released in May. I'm quite sure it's great, man. So, Oh, you haven't heard it? No, I have not. I want to see if a Spotted Picker can send me an advanced copy. Um, let me call them because I, uh, I have not heard it, the, the, the album. So. Uh, or you know what? Just what you need to do is send me your 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 information, your contact information. Yeah, like, yeah. I will. Send me your you know your like your address and stuff like that, and you you know just just give me every, everything I need to know. And yeah, I got I'll, it. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll also see. I don't know. I I don't. I'll send you, or I'll have somebody send you a cop. You know, the record. I know there's a video that's they just that's just been released. Um, like on, on YouTube, it's, on the on it, Facebook, yeah. Spotted Peckery made this video of the okay. of yeah. of the of uh, yeah. If you we have a website, you could go to my Facebook page or whatever. I think I think it's up there. <clears throat> okay, I will I will check it out after after a couple of minutes. Man. All right, awesome, super. Okay, Jerry, it was very nice talking to you. Good luck tonight, and stay Same in touch. And definitely, I want to visit you down there, man. Please do. Thank you, thank you, very right. I appreciate it. All right, thank you, thank bye, you. bye, bye, great night. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Ciao.